So there's a reason about material today. So what I'll do is I'll just get started showing you um, on the website. If you go to upcoming courses where the link is for the, and go to the course material, I've put up um, everything from last, um, last week. Um, but I've put up some solutions. So first of all, there are serial solutions to the uh, traffic modeling exercise, which you might want to look at. That was just a bit of um, a fun, really. But I will come back to these. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to describe, in quite general terms, the, the two major parallel programming models used in scientific and technical computing. And um, next week, I'll put up solutions in, in these, using these programming models, MPI and OpenMP, I'll put those solutions up, which are parallelizations of these. I won't do the Python one, but, but, but for C and Fortran, uh, there will be parallel versions. So that's hopefully why these are, these are interesting. But secondly, I have some example results from the Sharpen exercise, which hopefully some of you... This is actually these taken from a while back. But um, all I wanted to show was... Um, um, what we've plotted here is the speed up. Now, I'll come back to performance metrics um, today. But basically, um, speed up is how many times faster the code goes. And if you have, a, 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 obviously, a perfectly parallel program, you'd hope it goes 10 times faster on 10, 10 physical cores. This was run on the predecessor to Archer, but it was a very similar machine. And basically, there are three curves here. One is the perfect speed up. So we ran up to 32 parallel uh, tasks here. Um, that was only one node on this system at Hector. It would be actually nice to go to much bigger numbers, but we see the effects here. So if we go from one, the serial program, to running on 32 cores, we'd hope it would go 32 times faster, which is the straight line. Actually, it doesn't. You get this tail off because of overheads. And I'll come back today to talking about what those overheads are in very sort of fairly simple ways we can characterize them. But... Um, there are, two, um, there are two portions to this calculation. One is the calculation time and one is the overall, uh, and one is the I.O. So I've plotted the calculation time uh, here, and you would, uh, the calculation time is how much time it takes doing the calculation, which if you remember from the exercise sheet, this is in principle a perfectly parallel operation. Each pixel is independent from every other one. So you might ask, why doesn't it go 32 times faster? The reason is probably that... Um, this is processing a lot of data, and uh, this is this is on this is a shared memory system at least up to this scale, and it's probably this bottleneck of reading and writing from shared memory. So even on on, on your laptop or something, um, it's very it's very difficult to get perfect scalability. A program going four times faster on four cores because at least for scientific and technical computing, you're reading and writing a lot of data, and you saturate the memory bandwidth very quickly. A couple of cores can saturate the memory bandwidth. But also there's an I.O. overhead as well. Which I'll, so you should have seen that um, the overall runtime tailed off because there's a fixed I.O. overhead. So that illustrates that this, this, this program, at least taking a step back, splits into two, two, um, two pieces. One is reading and writing the data, which you can think of as being a serial task. There's no be the way I've written it, it's very naively, there's no benefit to parallelization there. It's all done by a single process. So that's this constant overhead. Then there's a the calculation part, which in principle you hope scales perfectly, speeds up perfectly with the number of cores. And we'll come back to simple models for that next time. But this was just to show you, this is the classic graph that people will plot in, uh, in parallel computing, sorry, is speed up. And I'll come back to that a bit more today. But I really just want to go um, through some basic concepts here. So the first one is a general talk about, the first talk today is going to be a general talk about how you decompose a problem. You know, what, what are the standard methods of taking a problem and splitting up into independent tasks or semi-independent tasks to allow you to, to execute it in parallel? The second lecture will, for those from a computer science background, may be fairly familiar, so I'll go through it relatively quickly. It's really talking about processes and threads and how they interact with the memory and how they interact with the operating system. The final lecture is, is hopefully uh, more interesting. It's how we use processes and threads um, to do parallel programming. And there are two models. They, 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 they correspond to quite different programming models. So I'll talk about why parallel programming. I'll talk a bit about decomposition. And then at the end, I will talk about some of these performance metrics. So why do we do parallel programming? Parallel programming is harder than serial programming, so why bother? Well, we covered this uh, last week, that basically 
up until 2005, processors were getting faster each year, and that has tailed off. So to, um, if you want to, to, to make use of a modern multi-core processor to solve a single task, you need to involve some kind of parallel programming because of the, the limitations we're reaching with single core um, performance. And single core performance is, is dominated by, um, well, as I said, the, the frequencies are flatlined because of power, uh, power consumption, heat, heat generation, heat dissipation. And in fact, there are some fundamental limits. I mean, as I said, I'm not a hardware person, but, but on a, a modern, um, a modern um, high-end processor, the, uh, the features that you're trying to, 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 um, to, to create to make the circuits are, I believe, of the order of maybe hundreds of atoms. They're getting down to sizes where you, you, know, you get starting to think, I'm not going to be able to get any smaller than this. I'm not going to be able to do smaller features than this. I'm not going to be able to put more transistors on a, uh, on a, on a chip. So, but the thing is, parallelism isn't a silver bullet, and it's a strange thing. People, people would love to believe in silver bullets. So people think, you know, I've got a one gigahertz machine. I buy a two gigahertz machine; it'll be twice as fast. I've got one CPU core. I buy two CPU cores. My programs will go twice as fast. That's not. It's, things aren't that simple, and it's just common sense. You know, if I buy a car which is twice as fast as my current car, I don't get to work twice as fast. Not the, it's, not, it's, not the speed, it's not the speed of my car which limits my ability to get to work on time. So, you know, you have to be careful. And so throwing lots of processors, throwing lots of, of hardware at a problem isn't necessarily uh, a silver bullet. But for a large class of problems, there are standard solutions. So um, we want to solve problems faster. I, I sometimes say the only reason why you do parallel computing is to make programs go faster. That's not really true. The other reason is to get access to large amounts of memory. Um, to, well, if you want huge amounts of memory, then you need a parallel computer. Um, uh, if you want to get um, many, many hundreds of terabytes of memory, you need a parallel computer. So sometimes you need to use parallelism, not for fun. But the, ma the major driver is computational limits. So we need to split the program up among different processors. We saw that for very simple, obviously almost trivial calculations, like adding up a list of numbers, that's relatively straightforward. But, but how do we ch ch tackle more realistic problems? And ideally, we'd like to run the program p times faster on p process. I, I'm being slightly, I'm slightly woolly about whether I say processors or processes. I apologise for that, but I'll come back to why that's. I would just that's a, a legitimate slip. But I'm slightly, uh, um, by here I mean process. I mean processor cores. But the important point is parallelization introduces an overhead. So how we split the problem up is cr critical, and there are two. Issues which limit, um, which stop your program, well, two fundamental issues which stop any program going, going p times faster with a parallelism of p processes or processor cores. The first one is communication. By splitting the program up, you need to, you introduce, in any other, the most trivial problem, you need, they need the, the, the tasks need to communicate with each other. And even in that adding up the numbers example from last week, you saw at the end there was a synchronization point. To, to compute the final total from the subtotals, there needs to be some interaction between the processes. And the second one is load balance. There's no point having a 1,000 processors doing a task if one of them does all the work and the other 999 do none of the work. So you need to balance the load. And that can be quite straightforward or it can be quite challenging. Um, and a kind of... Um, when we talk about tightly coupled program, what we mean, what we mean is that it's something which requires a lot of interaction between the parallel tasks, where the tasks are interacting with other a lot. The, 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 other, the other extreme is, co is called embarrassingly parallel. Um, so people are embarrassed. You know, if their problem is really, really trivial to, to make parallel, people are embarrassed by it. So there's little or no interaction between the parallel tasks. And the image sharpening exercise, partially because the very naive way I wrote it, was an embarrassingly parallel problem. What I meant is once I distributed the image to everybody, which is a very naive approach, everybody could independently decide to work on a subset of the, of the, pro, of the pixels. And that was, the, throughout the, the entirety of the calculation, there was no need for any interaction between the tasks. Only at the end, when we brought them back together. And there are, you know, there are certain classes of problems which you would call embarrassingly parallel. Most problems sit somewhere in between. That there are phases of the problem where there's a lot of communication, and then phases of the, of the, of, of the task where there's lots of calculation. So how do we split problems up to solve efficiently in parallel? So it depends on a number, of, a number of factors. One is the nature of the problem. That's the most important thing. You, know, you just look at the task, you look at the problem you're trying to solve, and you can identify various um, ways you can parallelize it. And this is, you know, often it's just sort of like um, it's kind of common sense, for example. Uh, you know, people realize that beginning of the 20th century that, you, you know, 
if you want to build a car, you could split building a car up into lots and lots of tasks and execute them in parallel. You could build a, um, a Model T Ford in lots of independent sections and pass it along. Uh, there's also the amount of communication required. Um, so, you know, you may have certain, certain um, um, uh, approaches may require a lot of communication, some, some may require less communication, but also support from the technologies. And that's why it's important to understand um, the two programming models which correspond I'll jump ahead of myself, correspond to the two architectures, the shared memory and distributed memory architectures. You need to understand what, they, what their limitations are before you can, uh, to make an informed choice of what the best parallelization strategy is. So the, the most classic example, um, and something which I'll come back to uh, as a very simple, the simple way of parallelizing this traffic model problem that I talked about last week, is called geometric decomposition. And I, the illustration here is classic one, is uh, weather forecasting. You have a map of the UK, uh, uh, sorry, Great Britain, being technically a map of Great Britain, um, and um, simulating the weather is, is, is largely the same calculation everywhere you do it. You just have different input data. And so um, we can split um, Great Britain up into lots of chunks and give a different chunk to each, to each processor. And they will require some communication between each other um, but largely they can operate in, pro in parallel. And for, for, for a large class of scientific and technical problems, which are solving physical, physical systems, that's, that's basically a fundamental approach. Now, you may have spotted one problem here already. You might say, well, surely simulating the weather over the ocean is easier or, or, or less easy than simulating the, ocean, the weather over land. Okay? Maybe, it's, maybe it's easier because you don't have to worry about the, the varying topography, different heights. Maybe it's harder because you have to simulate the action of the waves, but clearly they're different. So you would immediately say, well, this might look clever, but there might be a load balance problem. The people who've got all sea might spend twice as long as the people who've got all land or half as long. So these regular decompositions aren't always possible. On the right is a more complicated engineering problem. And when you have unstructured problems like this, um, What's happened? This is a, a simulation where um, the problem has been broken down, a continuous problem has been broken down to a lot, into a discrete set of, um, these are tetrahedra, but you just see the faces here, so you're actually seeing um, uh, triangles, but they're actually, they're actually the faces of a, 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 a the, the, the volume here has been discretized into a large number of tetrahedra, which is a standard technique in, in, in engineering where you need to deal with arbitrary shaped uh, objects. And it's been split up to, to be parallelized. And you can see that the different colors actually represent which processor is responsible for each domain. And there you can see that looks like a reasonably sensible way to split the problem up. But even doing this decomposition is a challenge in itself. It's, effect, it's a very large graph partitioning problem where you're trying to assign a large number of nodes. You're trying to color this graph so that lots of nodes are, that are connected are close together. Um, so you know, for, for, for a regular 2D grid, it might be quite simple. For an unstructured problem in 3D, it can be much harder. But, but the, the approach is the same. You take the problem, you split it up into a, a, as many domains as you have physical processor cores. But the overheads are, are communication. There, there is a cost. And um, if you do, if, you, if, you, if, if your domains, or we call, you can call them grains, you have a large amount of work, and you have some granularity of decomposition, if your grains are very large, as on the left, there's too little parallelism. You might say, well, that's only four regions there. I've got 20 processors. That's enough, not enough. But if you go to, um, to, to a large number of, 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 of tasks, you, you split the problem up very fine, then the communications dominate. It turns out in, in problems like this, typically the communication is around the boundaries. So you have to exchange boundary information. And again, that, that'll be, that's... Um, uh, made more concrete when you think about parallelizing the traffic model. It's a one D problem, but it's the same thing. But the communication is over the over the volume. So you have a surface to volume effect, and as you go to smaller and smaller regions, each process is work, processor is working on a smaller smaller task. The overhead of communications dominates. Relatively, you do more communication for calculation, and that gets worse and worse as you go up. So there there, there is this tension between you know. Uh, but trying to have a little, trying not to have too much communication, but trying to um, have a lot of, um, trying to use a lot of processors. And the challenge is that the way the architectures are going, modern machines are getting their, their power from having hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of processor cores. And so you're driven to having very, very small tasks because you're typically, well, we'll come back to this, but often your problem size might be fixed. 
And so if you have a fixed problem size and more and more processors, the individual tasks get smaller and the communications overheads get larger. And that's Amdahl's law, which we'll come back to. And I said, the, typically, um, what the communications in these problems, not, not always, but typically, is nearest neighbor. And what we do there is we, we, we have something called halo swapping. Uh, what happens is that uh, although a processor might only need this amount of information, so it might be, um, own this domain in the middle here, it needs information for its neighbors in some finite radius. This might be the distance that the wind is blowing. You know, in, in, in a particular time step, you might, need, you might need information from people who are, whatever, 20 or 30 kilometers away from you. And so what you do, because you know in advance what information you'll need, while, rather than grabbing it each time you need some information, going to somebody and say, oh, you, could you tell me what the, the weather is there and there and there, you, have a, you, you differentiate the calculation to separate communication and calculation phases. So you have a communication phase where you gather all the data that you are going to need, and that's called halo swapping, because you basically extend the local domain with a halo, a ring of data, which is filmed in from the neighbors. So this data from the, the extreme edge of this domain here is copied into this halo here, and, 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 and so all, all around. And once you've done this halo swapping, this communication, you then have all the information you need to do your calculation. Having done it, everyone else will have changed their data, and you have to then do another communication. But typically, scientific and technical programs have differentiated communication and calculation phases, and there will be communication, then calculation, and communication, then calculation. So it's typically not done on an on-demand basis. Uh, you try and do all the communication in a one-hour, bring everything together, and then do the calculation. But the problem is here, if you go to this kind of uh, situation on the right, where we have lots and lots of tasks, you have a large number of small messages, and a large number of small messages is very difficult to cope with, and that can slow your program down. The other problem is load imbalance, and um, this can be a problem. And a classic example might be if you were doing sort of feature detection. So I previously said that the classical approach here was that you divided your domain up into the same number of, you divide your problem up into the same number of domains as you had physical processors. So if I had four processors, I'd divide it up into four, four, four situations. If I have, I'm guessing, 64 processors on the right, I divide it up into 64 domains. If you have load imbalance, and so on the left there's the picture of the Mona Lisa, if you're doing feature recognition, clearly the feature recognition algorithm is going to have a very easy time up here. It's just going to say there's nothing there. But when the, the, the processor here that has to do the feature recognition around the eyes and the nose is going to probably spend, spend a lot more time. So you know, this is a, a difficult calculation to do. This is an easy calculation to do. So if I have 16 processors and I split the, the, the calculation up into 16 pieces, it's not going to work. This guy's going to finish early, have nothing else to do. So the trick here is to divide the problem up into more domains than you have processors, and then to assign those domains to the processors in some manner, perhaps on demand. So um, you assign multiple partitions per processor, and by doing that, you can, you can try and balance the load. You can, try and, um, you can try and make sure that everyone has roughly the same amount of work to do. So in fact, they don't even necessarily process the same number of domains. Somebody might spend all their time on this domain while somebody else cleans up that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one, the easy ones. But, but hopefully, overall, everyone uh, will, will do the same amount of work. And this is a classic example of something called a task farm, master worker, a controller worker idea, where you split the problem into distinct independent tasks, and the master process sends tasks to a worker, and the workers respond. And here the idea is the number of tasks is much greater than the number of workers. And so you can allocate the tasks on demand to idle work. It's a very simple parallel pattern. Now, it's one of the earliest patterns that was used in parallel programming. It doesn't scale particularly well. It's great if you've got a few tens of processes. If you've got thousands or hundreds of thousands of processes, this is simply not going to work because you clearly have a bottleneck here on the master. Um, but um, it is... It, you know, a real, a real scientific and technical program might have some phases which are like domain decomposition, other phases which are more like, more like master worker. Modern applications tend to, complicated applications have to, to, to tackle real problems, have to use multiple parallelization strategies often in the same, in the same program. But this is a classic example, master worker, and, uh, and there's lots of frameworks which will allow you to, to, to do this. Um, but it's a classic, classic example of, um, of how, to, um, how to parallelize a program. The considerations are 
well, if you've only got communication between the master and the workers, communication between the workers can complicate things. You might want to do that if you want to do work stealing. You might want to say, you, know, you might want to do it more dynamically. You might say, if somebody finishes early, they can actually steal. If, if, if each, if each um, processor has a stack of tasks to process, if somebody runs out, they might steal work from someone else's stack. Something like that, that gets... Uh, but in, in reality, the major issue is that the master process can become a bottleneck. The workers can be idle while waiting for, for the master to send the task. So um, that, that is, um, that, that's a problem there. So it's difficult to scale this uh, beyond to very large numbers in, in practice. Uh, resilience, what happens when a worker stops responding? The thing which is actually interesting about the task farm is it's one of the few parallel models, which is, well, parallel decomposition techniques, which is used in scientific and technical program that's, that's fault tolerant. The idea here is that the, the master has all the information about each task and it sends a prepackaged task to a worker who does it and sends it back. If, for example, the worker dies or stops responding, the master, the controller can just realize that and send the task to somebody else. Now, in, it may be a surprise to you, but in reality, most scientific and technical programs are not fault tolerant. So if you think about this example here, if this processor stops working, dies, for example, due to a hardware fault or a software fault, you have a real problem because all the data about the weather in the Outer Hebrides was stored on that processor and it's gone. There is no master repository of the whole. The data is distributed in the drain decomposition. And so actually implementing fault tolerance is really, really difficult because then you have to manually start replicating data. So in, in practice, Almost all, it may be a surprise to you, but almost all modern scientific and technical probes are not fault tolerant. What happens if there's a hardware or a software failure? They detect faults and they exit. They don't hang, but they do not continue. They just die, crash and burn. So what we do on Archer, um, I mean, uh, Claire can correct me if I'm wrong, but if there's a hardware fault and people's jobs die, we just refund them the money that they spent and they, get, they restart again. So you can checkpoint, you can manually checkpoint every few hours or something like that. But although it's a topic of research, modern high performance computers in the scientific and technical domain typically are not fault. The hardware is fault tolerant in the sense that it can be recovered and swapped in and out dynamically, but the applications that run on them aren't. Pipelines is another um, classic example of, of parallelism. It isn't tend, doesn't tend to be implemented much in software now. There are very, again, it's because of limited scalability. You know, if you can split, um, like building a car, into one, two, three, four, five stages, you can have different processes, different people working on each stage. The problem is the parallelism is limited by the number of stages. Of course, you could build more than one car at once. If you only have five stages and 50 people, you could build 10 cars at once. Pipelines really exist in hardware now. You know, modern hardware um, gets a, a result per clock cycle for a floating point multiplication or a floating point addition, although because by breaking that down into a pipeline of stages and executing um, multiple operations at once. So it's a, it's, it's a useful model to have in your mind, but in practice it's not used that much. Um, and so, you know, you, you, could, you know, you could imagine you can have pipelines, data coming in and results coming out on the end where each processor acts on data as it moves the pipeline. But the problem here is the, um, the scalability is limited by the number of stages in your pipeline, which is typically, you know, typically um, um, you might have, you know, like building a car. You can only identify maybe 10 or so, a few tens of different stages there. So I said that they're, they're implemented in hardware for CPU architectures, they're very heavily pipeline. Modern processors can have tens of stages. You can, you can, you know, you can pipe things together at the Unix shell level if you want to. A graphics GPU pipelines are very efficient now um, because it's uh, um, graphics is quite a nicely constrained operation. So modern graphics processors get their um, get their power from pipelining and, and, and massive parallelization. Um, where pipelines really come in is really at the higher level. So if you look at the higher level, for, if you're thinking of a calculation which you might be running. These stages could be things like, in a weather forecast, could be, could be gather data, you know, prepare the initial conditions, you know, run the simulation, you know, produce a, a visualization, and then produce some weather forecast that you see on the TV in the evening. So these stages might correspond to calculations actually being done on, on different computers. So the, whole, the entire scientific process may throw through a pipeline, but each stage is, is perhaps an entire parallel program in itself. 
Loop parallelism, uh, we'll come back to this um, uh, when I talk about threaded programming, but the way that, par because scientific and technical programs are often operating on large arrays, they're often dominated by sort of, you know, loops, do i equals 1 to 100, do j equals 1 to 100, do k equals 1 to 100. I'm speaking four times speak for i equals not i less than 100, i double plus. You can, looping over large arrays. So you have loops, which are very large loops, looping over hundreds, thousands of, of, of iterations. And this is often the source of parallelism. We saw, for example, that my, my adding up the numbers example from last week had a loop for i equals no i less than 7 billion i double plus, looping over all the people in the world. That's where the parallelism came from. And so uh, we'll come back to this, but OpenMP is, uh, is the way this is, um, threaded programming is the way this is um, um, implemented, typically in high performance computing. Um, but um, uh, it's not so, so the nice thing about this is it can be applied incrementally. The, the problem about this domain decomposition is a global change to your program. You've decided you want to parallelize your problem. You have to blow the whole problem apart. Loop parallelism is much nicer because you can identify the loops which take, are taking the time and, and then parallelize them. Your program goes faster. Then you can look on the, the loop which took the second amount of time, the third amount of time. Um, and so it can be applied incrementally in small steps. It tends to be work best with small-scale parallelism. That's for hardware reasons I'll come back to. It's not suited to all loops. Um, and other factors can dominate. I keep mentioning Amdahl's law. I think these slides, I've been slightly reordered from the talk that this came from, so I'll come back to what Amdahl's law at the end of this talk is. But we'll talk about loop parallelism in some detail in the next lecture. So here's an actual example, though. I mean, I've jumped ahead to give you some syntax, but the way it works is we have just a very simple loop here. For i equals no i less than n i double plus a i equals 2 times i. We're just initializing an array. Clearly, that can be done in parallel. Every iteration is independent. And so um, if you have hardware support for, for, for multiple um, threads accessing the same data, and we'll see how to do that, uh, you can parallelize that. And there, there are ways, if you come from a computer science background, you may, if I ask you to parallelize a program in threads, you might think about using POSIX threads. For scientific and technical programming, there's a, a set of compiler extensions called OpenMP, which are based on compiler directives that do that automatically. They're not doing any magic, they're generating threads under the hood, but the syntax is designed to, to be very easy to use for the kind of um, uh, loops and structures that appear commonly in, in scientific and technical programming. So very briefly, I want to talk about performance metrics and scaling. Um, you know, as I said, we want to make our program go faster, but we need to have some measure of that. And so there's some fairly obvious measures. Uh, we measure the execution time t. That might sound um, trivial, but um, it's not always trivial to say what you mean. You know, you can include uh, when you, how long does a program take to run? Do you include the I/O? Do you? But anyway, you've decided that you've, de you've decided on a benchmark calculation you want to do, and it takes a certain amount of time t. The the speed up is the time, uh, what I've got here, the speed up is how many times faster it goes. So the time taken on one uh, processor divided by the time taken on p processors. Now, I've got two variables here, n, p. n is the problem size, which I will leave fixed for the moment. Uh, for this, these slides, it's not, um, it's not relevant. We're just in, in, interested in the, in the variation number of processors. But the speed up is the time it took on one process divided by the time it took on p processes. So if it, if it took one second on one process, 0.1 of a second on 10 processes, the speed up is 10. And that's fairly obvious. How many times faster is it going? You can quantify that as an efficiency. You can divide the speed up by the number of processes. So if a program went nine times faster on 10 processes, you would say that was 90% efficient, where the, the maximum is, of course, 100%. Um, um, and the seri so what this is so this is what people typically pr typically quote. They will say, "Look at my algorithm. Isn't it great? It takes um, you know it goes ten times faster on twelve processes. It goes a thousand times faster on twelve hundred processes. Isn't that great?" Well, you have to be careful because you have to realize that there may have, you may have had to take an initial hit, in the sense that the algorithm, the approach you use to parallelize it, may not be the most efficient algorithm. So you don't really care if the parallel program goes 10 times faster than the serial one. Then you, sorry, if the parallel program goes 10 times faster on 10 processors than it does on one, if there was an alternative serial algorithm, which is, which is 20 times faster. 
So you really ought to work out the serial efficiency, which is the, um, the, the ratio of how long your, your algorithm takes on one process to what the best algorithm you could possibly have used is. And this is just to reflect the fact that you may have had to use, often you have to use more simple, potentially more simple algorithms to parallelize them. Because you know, the, the more complicated algorithms, which may have a lot of decision points, a lot of complicated, are, are too hard to parallelize. You take some hit to use a simpler algorithm, which is maybe not as efficient, might take twice as long on a single processor, but then you can recover that by running on lots of processes. Typically, people don't, don't mention this. So, so the classic, um, there's a number of papers being written, sort of jokey papers, you know, 101 ways to lie about the performance of your parallel program. And the classic one is to, to, to pick an algorithm which is fantastically parallelizable, runs 100 times faster than 100 processors, but is a really dumb thing to do. And in fact, you could do it much quicker another way. But anyway. So the, the thing we always talk about is scaling. So whenever you, if you're a parallel programmer, people always ask, how, how well does your problem scale? How well does your algorithm scale? So scaling is how the performance of a parallel application changes the number of processors is increased. But there's two ways to do that, which are called strong and weak scaling. Strong scaling is the first one you think of. It's how much faster can I solve the same problem using more processors? Okay, so I've got a problem to, this is keeping the problem size fixed. So if I've got a problem, I want to simulate the weather across the UK with a certain grid resolution. If I double the number of processors, does it go twice as fast? But actually, in the certain cases, weak scaling is what you want to do. What you do is you increase the problem size with the number of processors, and that keeps the, the amount of work per processor the same. So what you're saying is, if I've got twice as many processors, I want to solve, I want to solve a problem that's twice as difficult. And where that's useful is weather forecasting is a really good example. You have a fixed amount of time to produce a weather forecast. Let's say eight hours, OK? So you want to produce a 24-hour weather forecast. Obviously, if it takes more than 24 hours to produce, it's useless. So say you give yourself eight hours to produce a weather forecast so that you have a 16-hour lead time of prediction. If someone gave you a computer which was twice as fast, Producing the same forecast in four hours isn't much use. What you'd like to do is produce a more accurate forecast. You've been given an eight-hour window to produce the forecast. What you'd like to do is do a more accurate forecast. So for weather forecasting, if someone gives you more processors, you double the problem size. You double the number of grid points, which means using a finer resolution. So there are situations where, you know, or, um, where you would, if you give them more processor power, the natural thing to do is to tackle a harder problem. I once spoke to a bunch of engineers at Rolls-Royce, and we were saying, you know, we could get your calculation time from, from 12 hours to 6 hours. They were like, why would I want that? I leave at 5 in the evening. I submit my job. If it's done in the morning, you know, I don't care. You know, 12 hours, 5 hours, it's no difference. What they would want to do is to tackle, you know, they've got to fix, their, in their mind, 12 hours is, a, is, 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 is the time it takes to do a calculation. Would they, would, they would want to do a, given more processes, they want to do a more, well, more accurate calculation in that time. So these are called strong and weak scaling. Strong scaling is generally more difficult, to, uh, it's more difficult to achieve. The reason being, this diagram is, is the one here. Strong scaling corresponds to going from the left to the right. As you get more processors, you, the, the, the amount of work per processor gets smaller, so the overheads get smaller. Overheads get larger, sorry. So a typical scaling graph is strong scaling. This is what I showed with the, with the sharpen example. We had the same want to solve the same problem, sharpen up the same image, but increase the number of processes. And this is the kind of graph you'll get. Linear speed up is 256 times faster than 256 processes. In reality, it tails off. Weak scaling, perfect weak scaling corresponds to, to constant runtime. So an ideal strong scaling is it goes 256 times faster on 256 um, processors. Ideal weak scaling is that the runtime stays the same. I double the number of processors, I double the problem size, it still takes the, amount of time, the same amount of time. So the ideal is a straight line, but the actual deviates from that because you have some overheads. Um, and so, so that's, those are the two measures that we have. And so this is the classic kind of graph. If you, if you, run, the, 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 um, if you run the Sharpen example, this is the kind of performance graph you will see. So the question is, you know, can we model that? Can, can we have some way to, to kind, of, kind of model that? And that's what the final part of this lecture is. Um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, there is an inherent limit to speed up when we paralyze problems. I said, for example, for the, um, for, for the, the sharpened example, the I.O. 
is done in serial. A single master processor does the read and write of the data. It doesn't matter how many processors you throw at that problem, you're going to still have this fixed I.O. overhead. And that's encapsulated, if you like, equations in something called Amdahl's law. So back in 1967, Gene Amdahl, this is 50 years ago, Gene Amdahl said, the performance improvement to be gained by parallelization is limited by the proportion of the code, which is serial. And it's fairly obvious. If you have a calculation which is, you run on one processor, but 50% of the calculation is inherently serial. It's not going to benefit from throwing more processors at it, like I.O., for example, or at least naive I.O., but half the calculation could benefit from, from parallelism. So this is like the, the sharpening example. This is the I.O. phase. This is the calculation phase. As you throw more processors at the problem, the only bit which is tackled is this bit here. This serial overhead remains constant. Okay? And so, for example, here, on eight processors, the speed up is only 1.8. Because although this part goes eight times faster, this part stays the same amount of time. So it's really just a, it's really just a, 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 a pragmatic observation. But you can put that into, um, into equations. And um, Amdahl's law says, if you believe a program has two categories of components, an inherently sequential section that can't be run in parallel, and potentially parallel sections, then, well, let's say the fraction alpha is completely serial. So on that previous slide, alpha was, was 0.5. 50% of the calculation was inherently serial, because if we look at one processor, 50% of the calculation is 50% of the time is black. Okay. And we assume a parallel part is 100% efficient. It's a naive assumption. And the parallel runtime is the serial time plus the parallel time. The serial time is, again, n is kept fixed all the way through here. I'll come back to n later, but n, I'm just thinking of fixed problem size, so we're only interested in varying p. The serial time is alpha times the runtime on one process. So that's, by definition, the serial fraction. And the parallel time is the remainder, which is 1 minus alpha, divided by the number of processors, because we're saying that the parallel part is, is, is um, perfectly parallel. Now, if you, if, you, if you mess around a bit, you can convince yourself the parallel speed up is p over alpha p plus 1 minus alpha. Does that make sense? Well, yes, it does. If alpha is 0, the parallel speed up is, 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 um, is p, so that's 100% efficient. If alpha is 1, uh, then the parallel speed up is, um, is, is 0. Is, is, then the, the, the parallel speed up is, is 1. It stays flat. And so you can see here, it's not rocket science, that if you take p to infinity on the right-hand side, the parallel speed up is limited by 1 upon alpha for any p. So that's just looking at this diagram saying it doesn't matter. Alpha here is a half. Because half the calculation is serial, this can't go more than twice as fast, no matter how many processes I throw at it. It's just, I mean, equations can, can hide fairly obvious statements. So again, if I have a program which is 99% parallel and 1% serial, I can't make that go more than 100 times faster because there's always this, what, this, this, this overhead, which is 1%. And so Gene Amdahl actually used that as an, as an argument for why parallel computing wouldn't work. Because, for example, if I have alpha equals 0.1, if I run a problem on um, 16 processes, the speed up is 6.4. But I run a problem on 1,000 processes, the speed up is only 9.9. It's never going to get above 10. So, you know, you're saying, well, that means if I want to run on a 1,000 processors, my serial fraction is going to have to be less than 0.1%. I'm going to have to have an algorithm and an implementation where the serial fraction is vanishingly small to use large numbers of processors, and that doesn't seem tractable. But it turns out that, in practice, as you get bigger, pro bigger programs, bigger computers, you tend to run bigger programs. And bigger programs, larger, if you use larger data sets, typically the serial overhead is smaller. So um, this is called Gustafsson's law, but it's just saying that um, if, 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 if I run on eight processors and it turns out that my parallel uh, calculation scale is eight times as much, but the serial overhead stays the same. If you have a problem where the serial overhead is independent of problem size, okay, then if you run on larger problems, then the serial overhead becomes relatively less important. And so Gustafsson's law says, well, actually, if I ran on eight times as many processors and made the program eight times as big, the speed up would now be reasonable. We're still limited by the serial refractor becomes less important. So the question there is, you know, why is it? Is it true that in real calculations, if you double the problem size, the amount of 
parallelism goes up by a factor of two, but the, the, the overheads stay relatively con stay constant. And to a large extent, it's not completely trivial. Uh, for example, the, the sharpen example is a complete counterexample to that. Okay? If I double the problem size, I have twice as much data, so my I.O. phase, which I said was the serial overhead, is twice as long. But in real scientific and technical calculations, of which often involve um, boundary swapping, I'll come back to this diagram here. Okay. As you make the, the, the overhead in parallelism here actually comes from the communications. It comes from exchanging this boundary data. And as you make the problem bigger, or the boundary data, because of a surface to volume effect, the boundary data becomes relatively smaller. If I if I if I double the problem size from L to L squared, um, my, um, my my um, my amount of work. Oh, sorry, if I if I double the problem size. Um, uh, if I increase L, the, the, the size of the simulation, the amount of work scales as L squared because it's the, it's, the, it's the area. The amount of communication scales linearly with L because it's, it's the surface effect. So although it's not completely true that it's a fixed amount, in practice, in real parallel programs, as you in, in most parallel programs, uh, well, well sort of conforming ones, as you increase the problem size, the parallel overheads become relatively smaller. And so the Gustafsson's law is an idealization. It is reasonably well, um, reasonably well um, borne out in practice. Um, so you can turn that into equations, but I don't really want to go through the equations. But basically, you can convince yourself that if the serial fraction stays is independent of the problem size n, but the parallel fraction is it scales with n, you can um, you can convince yourself. That if you scale the problem size with CPUs, i.e. set n equals p, which is weak scaling, you set the problem size equal to the number of processors, then the efficiency is alpha over p plus 1 minus alpha. In other words, you get constant efficiency. In other words, if, you have, if your program is 90% efficient on 100 processors, you then run it on 200 processors, it'll still be 90% efficient because you've doubled the problem size, you've doubled the parallelism. So there's a bit of math there, but that's really... Gustafsson's law says if you scale the problem size with the number of processors, i.e. formally you set n equals p, which, was that, which I called weak scaling, then parallelism does work. You can use large numbers of processors. And so uh, Gustafsson's law, if I again had an alpha of 0 0.1, if I had 16 processors and I use strong scaling, which is, uh, sorry, if I, if I have a problem which, is, um, which has got an alpha of 0 0.1, which is the one I described before. If I scale up to 16 processors, Amdahl's law says I'll only get 6.4 times, 6 times as fast. But if I scale the problem size with the number of processors, I'll go 14.5 times as fast, which is there is about 90% efficient. But if I've got to 1,000 processors, if I keep the problem size fixed, we saw that we were limited. We could only get a speed up of 10. But if I scale the problem by a factor of 1,000, it goes 922 times faster, which is, again, 90% efficient. So you can, simple arguments can convince yourself that, that to a first approximation, a leading order approximation, if you scale the problem size of the number of processors, then, um, then, you get, then you can use large machines. Now, when we had thousands or only thousands of cores, that was a reasonable thing to do. Now we have millions of cores, your scientists might say, you know, um, you can now solve a problem with a molecule which has got 10 times as many atoms. They might say, well, my molecule's only got, you know, okay, my molecule's only got so many atoms. You know, I don't want to solve a problem with 10 times as many atoms. That's all I've got. And so, um, or, or, so, so we, are, we are reaching the limits of this. It's not the universal solution, um, but it is the major reason why you can use very large thousands, tens of thousands of cores, is there are scientific and technical problems. Uh, if you make the problem bigger or have more points, which is making the grid resolution smaller, the parallel overheads become um, relatively uh, less significant. And as I said, I said it, I can naively increase the problem size, but you can actually add extra complexity. So, so you can increase the problem, or you can add more complexity. So, so a weather forecast, might, naively you might say, well, I've got twice as many processors, I could make the grid size smaller so I have twice as many points. Or you could say, right, I've got twice as many processors. I can now do more accurate simulations of the clouds, of, of, of the sea, of, of other, other, other effects, which I previously ignored. I have an analogy here, which, is, uh, which I won't go into. This is just a, 
it's on the slide. It's basically saying this is the same thing as saying um, there's no point in flying from, in Concord uh, from, from, um, from London to New York because it doesn't matter if you fly on a, on, on a slow plane like a Boeing 747 or a fast plane like Concord, it still takes you a fixed amount of time to drive to the airport, check in, board, and at the other side, you know, onboard, pass through immigration and come up come over. Air travel is like a serial part which is check-in, which is independent of the mode of travel, and a parallel part which is the flight which can, be in, which can go faster uh, if you use a faster aeroplane. So these slides are just saying that Amdahl's law and Gustav's law just common sense. You're showing that, you know, flying from, going from your home in London to the centre of New York, using Concorde doesn't make the journey much faster because you're dominated by the, all this check-in and, and, and security at each end. But if you, if, if you were to fly from London to Sydney, Australia, then because the parallel part, the part which benefits from increased performance, which is the flight time, goes faster, but the overheads of check-in and clearing security stay the same, then it's worthwhile. Now, someone pointed out that, that Concorde couldn't fly from London to New York, uh, from London to Australia, because it's too far, but that's a, that's a detail I won't, I will, um, I'll, I'll. Load imbalance is possibly more important. And the reason I'll, go, I'll cover this slide is that the, the example to go with this um, exercise is a Mandelbrot set example. It's a classic example. I'll go through it slightly at the end, but it's a classic example of a very load imbalance problem. Computing the Mandelbrot set, which is this nice, colourful, uh, squiggly fractal, um, if you divide that up into domains, certain domains are very easy and certain domains are very hard. And the ratio in hardness can be orders, you know, orders of magnitude, thousands of times. So that's the example. And in fact, the, the Mandelbrot set um, example is not really limited by, by, by how, much, how many processes you throw at it. It's limited by load balance. The technique to, to, to computing the Mandelbrot set quickly is to balance the load. And it's, it's really just common sense. If there were one, two, three, four, five, four of us, Anna, Paul, me, and Helen, and we had to pack some boxes. Um, four people back boxes with cans of soup. It's one minute per box, okay? Well, if Anna has six boxes, I have one box. Uh, Paul has one box. I have three boxes, and Helen has two boxes. The important point is that um, we're, we're packing 12 boxes, okay? So if one person was to pack 12 boxes, it would take 12 minutes, okay? So four people packing 12 boxes will take three minutes. Well, unfortunately not. Because, because we all have to wait for Anna to finish. We can't ship the delivery until Anna has finished and Anna's been given too many boxes to do. So the important point about load balance is that if you parallelize a calculation, the overall runtime is typically dominated by the slowest task. Okay? Everyone has to wait for the slowest person. So in fact, although we've thrown four, four processes at this, we want to pack 12 boxes, we've thrown four people at it. It only goes twice as fast. It takes six minutes because Anna has all the work. If we distributed the load evenly so that everyone had three boxes, then it would, um, it would only take three minutes. And the way, the way I've quantified this is um, it's not a, I don't know if it's a standard definition, but I find it useful. It's the load imbalance factor is the maximum load over the average load. And why this is useful is it gives you two useful metrics. First of all, if the load imbalance factor is one, you've solved it. If the maximum load is the same as the average load, then everyone has the same amount of work. So, you're, so, so load and balance factor of one is perfect load balance. But more um, importantly, if the load and balance factor is greater than one, it tells you how much better you could have done had you balanced the load perfectly. So for example, in this box pack, the load and balance factor was six over three. The maximum load was six, which was Anna's number of, of, of cans, a number of boxes, and the average load was um, three, so that's two. So... The initial time was six minutes because the load imbalance factor there was two. You could compute the best time would be six over two, which is three. So what you're going to do in the Mandelbrot set is you're going to compute the Mandelbrot set and, the, and the, the program will print out statistics for what the maximum average load were. And from that, you can work out, OK, it took 20 seconds, but if I balanced the load correctly, I could have actually done it in 10 seconds. And then you can see if in practice you can get down to that. And the way you balance, I'll come back to how you do that. But th I think this is a useful measure. The maximum load of the average load is a useful measure because A, if it's one, it's perfect. B, if it's greater than one, it tells you, gives you some indication of how much better you could do if you were to balance the load uh, perfectly. So a summary here, well, there's lots of considerations in paralyzing a code. A variety of standard patterns ex uh, exist and we'll cover some of them in the, in the practical session, namely 
Um, the Sharpen example was sort of um, tri trivial parallelism. The Mandelbrot example is a task farm. And the, the simplest, well, the most obvious way to do the, the, um, the uh, traffic model to which I'll give out solutions, that's the fourth exercise this week, but I'll give you out solutions next week, is to do it as a domain decomposition. Scaling is really important. The more a code scales, the larger a machine it can take advantage of. So, for example, if you apply for time on Archer, you say, I want to use Archer, I want to run my program, I want a million CPU hours. One of the things we ask for on the application form is, could you demonstrate the scalability of your code? Show us graphs or performance measures which demonstrate that you, you can benefit from the number of cores that Archer has. We expect people to submit these kind of scaling curves. Andal's law and Gustafsson's law are useful models. Um, they are useful conceptual models. They allow you to give a first order approximation of, um, of, of how things work. They, they, they kind of explain why things tail off and why larger problems are more scalable uh, because weak scaling is, is easier than strong scaling. However, I have tried many times to come up with an example where you could fit to these laws and even the, the Sharpen example, which is specifically constructed to have a perfectly serial part, which is the I.O., and a perfectly parallel part, which is the calculation. If you, if you run that on a real machine and try and fit it to Amdahl's law, it doesn't really work because the problem is there are so many other factors going on in real machines. Real machines are so complicated. The performance is so affected by caching and all kinds of things you don't have direct control over. So they're useful models. They're useful first-order approximations. Quantitatively, it's often very difficult to, to actually fit, you know, to actually do fits. I've never come up with an example which, which gave you very good um, fitting. However, load balance is also a crucial factor. Um, the number of people who, who basically spend ages trying to optimize their program, saying, my program isn't scaling very well. I must have done the, I'll make the communications. There must be a way to do the communications better. I must be able to be clever or reduce the overhead. And it turns out, actually, that's all pointless because the reason that their program wasn't scaling wasn't, intrinsic, wasn't parallel overheads. It was the fact they, didn't have, they hadn't load balanced their code. Some of the processes have more work to do. And if that's true, th then that's going to slow you down. Uh, and metrics exist to give an indication of how well your code is performing. Typical metrics are parallel speed up and, and parallel efficiency are the two things which people typically um, typically quote. So um, that's the um, that's the, the 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 end of that lecture. I've got just in the last five. So I'm trying to show you the fractals example. So so I've given you out the source code to run this. There's an exercise sheet which goes through the, the mechanics of how you compile this program, how you run it, how you get pretty pictures out of it. But I wanted to tell you what we're trying to do. So explore how the granularity of the task impacts performance. So as we said, the way in a task farm to balance the load is to have more tasks than there are processors. So the more tasks you have, the smaller they are, the better you can balance the load, okay? the more flexibility you have. However, in practice, as you make the task, if you make the task too small, you're dominated by communication. Okay? So you want to have small tasks because that allows you to balance the load to very, a very fine level, make sure everyone does the same amount of work. But the smaller the task is, the, the, the higher the overhead is. Because to give you a task, I have to send you a message, will come, and then you have to receive it, do it, and give it back to me. So there's an overhead there. So it's trying to balance these two off. Um, remember, the runtime of the code is determined by the slowest running task. And I introduced this load imbalance fact, which I think is a reasonable way of quantifying this. Uh, what are fractals? I, there's some equations here. I won't really go through them. But um, the Mandelbrot set is just a way of you iterate some, some recurrence relation and see if it diverges or, or, or converges. And you, get, you can plot it. And what you plot is the number of iterations it takes to, um, um, to, uh, ugh, to diverge. I think that's the right way. Uh, but you get nice pictures, basically. Um, but the, the, so, so, so for each, the Mandelbrot set, you take a large grid, and each pixel can be processed independently. And by, by, by applying this recurrence relation to the pixel with some starting value, you can decide if it's inside or outside the Mandelbrot set. But the most important point is, are the Julia set slightly more complicated? Uh, the, the code can do the Mandelbrot set and the Julia set. There is only one Mandelbrot set. But there are an infinite number of Julia sets. So the, Ju the Julia set is parameterized by a complex number. And if you pick the right complex number, you get really nice pictures. You can look up Wikipedia. It's got some nice. Um, but for a moment, I'll ignore that. Let's do the Mandelbrot set. So to visualize the Mandelbrot set, 
you represent the complex plane as a grid. As I said, the way you do it is you, 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 you iterate this series and you compute the number of iterations it takes to diverge and you color the value of n according to this, um, to this number, the number of iterations it takes for the series to diverge. So the important point about the Mandelbrot set is these areas are very quick to compute, okay? Um, because if you've got a, these numbers are large, these numbers are big, okay? That's probably minus one, minus one. Very quickly these diverge. So it's very, it takes you a few iterations to say uh, that, that, that point is outside the Mandelbrot set. That's very quick. But these areas inside the Mandelbrot set are very slow to convert, are very slow to compute. Because you iterate the series for 10,000 times and it hasn't diverged, you say, well, it's probably never going to diverge. So it takes you thousands of times longer to, to realize that something is inside the Mandelbrot set as opposed to outside. So in the pictures, red tasks are easy, black tasks are hard by orders of magnitude. And so how we parallelize it, um, we can decompose the grid into two, 2D blocks, and there's no communication between blocks. But we don't know how much work is, in advance is, is needed. So what we do is we split the grid into blocks. We hand the blocks out to the processors, and then when, it, when somebody is finished, they get, they get the next block. So there's a, there, there's a controller who, who's basically giving out the task, and they're just given out on demand. And so that the controller hands them out and the workers process them. So we don't, we don't do anything clever in advance. We don't work out how long a task is going to do. We just give it to somebody, and when they finish, we give them another one. And if you run the code, for example, you might say that, you know, processor, the, the distribution of tasks to processors is therefore not defined. But the, just to try and understand the way the code is written, the way I print the, um, the way I, I, I draw the diagrams, the tasks are scanned from left to right, then moving upwards. So you start in the bottom left-hand corner and go up, up the way. So here's an example. Um, I ran this. Uh, I had what? So I ran this on five processors, which meant there was one master and four workers. Okay. So each one of the blocks can be processed by one of four workers, and I've numbered them here: one, two, three, four, based on who did them. The other thing you can you can actually uh, you can actually the, um, independently to choose the number of tasks. So I said, I've got four workers, but I'm going to choose 16 tasks. So that's split up into a four by four grid. And you can see that what happened was that um, we're scanning from bottom left. Initially, everyone gets one task, but process one finished quickly, because I said these red tasks are quick. It got another one, process four. Then process two gets a really hard task, this black region. And you'll see that process two doesn't get another task at all. So basically, Process two spends, this, this, this calculation, you can probably look at the timing, is dominated by the runtime of process two because it gets the hardest task. And what, we, what we're going to do, the easiest, the most quantitative thing to do here is to keep the number of workers fixed, the number of processors you're running on fixed, and vary the task size, make the task smaller and smaller and smaller. And so naive you think is you make the task smaller, the load, the load will be more, more, more better balanced and therefore the runtime will decrease, but at some point the tasks get too small and the runtime increases. Now actually on a machine like Archer, which has a very, very fast network, you probably don't see the runtime increase till the tasks are tiny, till the tasks are almost a single pixel. You will see the runtime increase, but it, you have to get down on a, a more general network cluster machine, you would see the task time increase, you know, when the, when the tasks were a few tens of, hundreds of pixels, 10 by 10 blocks. Um, and so, few notes. Well, I'll give you, okay. Spy with the source code, compile and run on the machine, visualize the results. It's quite fun because you get some nice pretty pictures. And um, for a fixed number of workers, improve the load balance by increasing the number of tasks, uh, decreasing the task size. You can compute, the, it prints out enough stat, stats to, to, to compute the load balance factor. So for example, um, if you run naively, you might run Initially, and it takes 10 seconds, it says the load and balance factor is 5. That would lead you to believe that if you balance the load correctly, it should only take 2 seconds. But you will see, hopefully, that although you start to approach 2, you never reach it, because as you make the task so small that, you, that you're per perfectly balancing the load, the runtime goes up because you have too many tasks. It's all done, and all the time is lost in the coordination. So the exercise hopefully goes through in, um, in gory detail. And there's some there's some, uh, there are some results here which I won't go through till next week because they won't make sense until you've had a look at the, look at the, uh, look at the example. So that's taken me up to three. What I'll do is, if there's no questions, I'll start lecturing at half past three. And there's two lectures this afternoon. One is on processes and threads, which are the building blocks of 
parallelism for scientific computation. Then I'll talk about shared and, and distributed memory programming. I'll grow through the process and threads quite quickly because um, it's uh, a lot of you may know it, and if you don't, it's not it's not it's a it's not completely essential. I mean, the, the final lecture is more conceptual. Um, the process and threads lecture is a bit more lower level. We go, I go through that reason, in that order for, for, for certain reasons, but I'll go through the first lecture relatively quickly and spend more time on the, on the parallel models lecture. But I'll start again at three o'clock, uh, half past three um, in 25, 30 minutes, and we'll, we'll go through those till the end. But I said, um, hopefully the exercises this week illustrate um, all these points. The Mandelbrot set example allows you to, to, to play around with a task farm, look at load balance, and I've got thought experiments for the traffic model, but they will relate directly to the, 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 the uh, message passing and shared variables parallelization models that I'm going to describe after the break. And then I'll give you that source code at, before next week, which actually shows you how they work in practice. Okay, so I hope to see you back here at half past three. Uh, next week, I'm going to talk, take a slight um, sidestep, but talk about a very important uh, couple of topics which are, which are very uh, important in scientific and technical programming. One is floating point numbers. We've said, you know, so naively, that um, straightforwardly, that, that, that we're interested in how the standard characterization of performance for parallel computers in scientific computing is, is how many floating point operations they, second they can do. That is what is 0 0.375 times 1.842. How, how do you store these numbers on a computer? Integers are fairly easy to store on computers. Floating point numbers are, are not so straightforward, and, and the important point is that that leads to various issues you need to consider with floating point cal calculations. Numbers are only stored to a finite accuracy, a finite precision. So I'll talk a bit about that next week, and also um, talk about random numbers. And that, again, in a deterministic world like computing, it might seem strange that, that random numbers come in, but for classes of simulations, um, random numbers are very important. And a change from last year, which, well, it's a year and a half ago, the final session I'll talk about GPUs, graphical processors. And I think it's quite important. There's a lot of been a lot of interest in graphical processors using GPUs for, not for graphics, but for, for large-scale computation for maybe five, ten years. It's become very popular in the past five years or so. Um, although they're, they're sort of new in terms of hardware and slightly different programming techniques, um, the things we've talked about last week and this week, specifically shared memory architectures, decomposition techniques, and what I'll talk about, about sh threaded programming and parallelism, those just come together. GPUs are just an extreme example or sort of edge case, but they're still fairly, you still need to understand the concept I've talked about last week and this week to understand GPUs. So it fits definitely after the first two weeks, and I've put it in the fourth week rather than than the third week. I'm going to briefly talk about operating systems, processes, and threads, because these are the building blocks where we, we build parallelism from. I think I'll go through this relatively quickly, but I think it's, it's important. Um, again, if you're from a computer science background, this won't be surprising, but, but parallel programming, to a large extent, both on the hardware and the software level, scientific pro and large-scale parallel computing, it sort of hijacks or you, just uses stuff that's out there already. So, so, for example, you know, if we want to build a large barrel of computer, we buy a lot of, of normal computers and network them together with some network. And so parallel programming is built out of processes and threads, but if you're, if you're not from a computer science background, you might you think that these, oh, these, are, these are invented for this. No, no, processes and threads as, as operating system concepts have been around for years, decades. We just kind of hijack them for parallel computing. But I will, I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, so I'll sort of talk about what an, an operating system does, but really concentrate on what, what is special for HPC or really what isn't special for HPC. I'll talk about processes and threads, just enough to motivate what we're going to talk about in the final lecture, which is how we actually do parallel programming. So what do operating systems do? Well, I think the most important thing is uh, the diagram on the right. The operating system mediates as you know, between you and the hardware. And so, um, you know, you as a user write some application which has calls to um, various functions and, and memory allocations and whatever you want to do, which are implemented on the hardware, but the OS sits between you and the hardware. So you don't access the hardware directly. You don't say, please give me that particular physical piece of memory. You don't say, please run this particular application on that CPU core. 
these are mediated for you by, by the hardware. But the two important uh, points to consider which are relevant parallel programming are processes and threads. Now, in fact, operators for HPC, again, um, we've, HPC systems have always used Unix. Um, now it's dominated by Linux. That wasn't true 15 years ago, maybe, but, I mean, it is universally true now that almost all uh, machines use Linux of some, some flavor. Uh, the top 500 list I mentioned, there was this, this, this um, uh, beauty parade of the fastest machines in the world called the top 500 list. From June 2016, which is like a year ago, only three in the top 500, three HP systems, HPC systems the top 500 didn't use Linux, and they were all using um, AIX, which is IBM's Unix, partly because IBM have their own processor, the power, IBM power. So, uh, and Windows isn't really used for HPC. Um, so, you know, almost all HPC systems use some version of Linux, possibly customized, possibly uh, cut down, um, and, uh, yeah. So um, CentOS is particularly popular. Um, so I mean that that has that's good and bad has good and bad features. Um, Linux is very common and well supported. When it was first adopted 10 or 15 years ago, you could have argued it was a bit immature mm -hmm. compared to other things like other Unix versions have been around for much longer. But it's it's um, it's pretty pretty okay now. Uh, so I said just to say. Again, to, to the person who's come from a, um, a desktop computing background, HPC is very, it can seem very old-fashioned. It really is old-fashioned computing, dominated by the command line and Linux. Um, you kick up a shell on a machine. And so, you know, although people have gone through phases of trying to, 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 to do more GUI-type models for doing HPC, basically, um, it's pretty old-fashioned text editors and, uh, and good old-fashioned um, um, terminals. So what is a process? So when you run an application or a program, you compile a program, you run an application, uh, it becomes an operating system process. And the important point about a process is it has its own memory, completely ring-fenced from other processes. And so that's actually implemented in, in, in hardware now. The, the memory system allows, you know, seg segregates processes from each other. So you have processes, and um, they can't access each other's memory. And that's there for security. If your web browser crashes, and you don't want it to randomly scribble over your word process. In the old days, you know, we didn't have this. In the first Macs came out, there was no um, the classic funny little Macs, uh, Mac computers. Um, you know, there, there was no memory protection. Different processes could just scribble over each other's memory, so they crashed all the time. One process went haywire, it could scribble over the memory, all the other ones, and they were always crashing. So memory protection is very, very important, but it means that, um, processes are, are ring-fenced things. They, they, they run a, a program and they have their own memory. And that's going to be a problem because, of course, the definition of parallel programming is we want, we want things to task co cooperate with each other. So if we want multiple processes to cooperate on the same problem, how do they talk to each other? How do they communicate when they, 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 their memories are ring-fenced ring from each other? We'll come back to that. The important po concept is each process is scheduled to run by the OS. So, you know, on a typical machine, you may, you may be running hundreds of processes, your programs, all the kind of operating system stuff going on, and um, the, the operating system decides what to run and when. And so, um, um, this actually, um, um, this, this slide is slightly, okay, I've had to t take a few um, talks out from the original talk. Um, when you do... Um, multi-core parallelism, when we do parallelization, when we write parallel programs, it turns out it's very much specified by the user. We have to manually go in and say, I want to run this program in parallel. You know, could you run it in parallel? So if you, if you say that, um, you know, parallelism, it's, parallel programming is it's not in its infancy, but it's still relatively immature. To write a parallel program requires user intervention. It requires you to use techniques um, which you have to do by hand. With, lim with only limited help from the compiler. If parallel programming still requires manual intervention, why are multi-core laptops popular? Why would anyone of 10 years ago wanted a multi five years ago wanted a multi-core laptop with multiple CPU cores when, when the programs they were running weren't parallel? Well, the point is that the operating system, if you have a multi-core laptop and you're running four processes, it can schedule them on different processor cores. So the reason that multi-core laptops are popular is not for running parallel programs, it's for running multiple programs at the same time efficiently. 
Operating systems have always scheduled multiple processes. In the old days, when you only had one CPU core, what it would do is it would, it would time slice them. Every 10 milliseconds or so, it would decide what process to run. And just like an animation, which is separate frames, that gave the illusion of multiple processes running at the same time. It looks like even a single core laptop is running hundreds of things at once. What it's actually doing is time slicing them, running them in order for maybe 10 milliseconds or so, and then running them again. However, with a multi-core processor, the operating system has two choices to make, not only what application or process to run, but which processor, what CPU core to run it on. And so uh, it makes that decision. And of course, it then allows it to genuinely, your, 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 parallel, your, your multi-core laptop can genuinely be running more than one application at once. Um, and so, as I said here, this I've just said um, uh, here, the only complication here is that um, some hardware has something called symmetric multi-threading or um, or uh, Intel called it hyperthreading, and this can just be a confusion because it allows one physical core to run two, two, two processes at once, and um, the way that's done is is, is um, um, the operating system just thinks there are four cores. So, for example, my laptop says it has four cores. It doesn't really. It actually has two physical cores, each of which is capable of running two hyperthreads, as they're called at once. And so, again, this is a kind of extreme example. The operating system is there to insulate you from the hardware. And on a modern-day computer, it can be quite hard to work out what the hardware is. The operating system insulates you so much. Even the question of how many CPU cores do I have can be quite difficult to answer. But anyway, so what you do when you run one processes applications, you run them, you give them to the operating system, and it schedules them across the, 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 the CPU cores. So the important point about processes is they're deliberately ring friends from each other. So if I run... Program one and program two, they cannot share memory with each other. And that's deliberate so that if one program crashes, it can't scribble over the memory of another one. If you want to share memory, you want to use threads. So threads on a modern day computer are very, very similar to processes. But there's a hierarchy that a single process could contain multiple threads. So you run a single program, which is a single process, and at runtime, it can generate multiple threads. And each, each thread is really like a child process from, contained within the parent process. So you might launch one process here, process zero, and it spawns two threads, thread zero and thread one. And so these are then running independently. And there are two important things to, to, to recognize. One is these threads are just like many programs. There's very little difference in the modern operating system between a process and a thread, except that Processes can't share, easily share memory, but threads can. Threads can all share the memory of the pro- parent process. So if you run, a, if you run a, a program, an application, and allocate a gigabyte of memory, then you spawn multiple threads. All those threads can read and write to, the, to this, that piece of memory. And clearly that maps on nicely to this concept of a shared memory architecture, where physically you have multiple CPU cores connected to the same physical memory. The second thing is that these threads, again, can be scheduled independently. So they, could, they can genuinely run in parallel. So this is how you can get parallelism in this threaded model. You can, spawn, you can you run a single program, but at runtime it spawns multiple threads, which are then scheduled independently on the, on the processor cores. And so um, all threads in the process have access to the same memory, which is the memory of the parent process. Now, again, threads predate parallel programming. You know, you might in, in games programming, you might say, well, I want one thread to control the spaceship, one to control the missile, one to do with keyboard input. But you want them to share memory because you want them all to read and write to the same game memory, which you might think of as being the screen. It's quite a naive analogy, but it's, it's kind of how it works. Um, and the, the operating system is aware, is aware of threads. Um, it, for example, it will make sure that it runs them all. So, for example, you, know, you want all the game operations to, to proceed so the operators will make sure that the threads get some fair share of each other. The only difference between threads and processes is that switching between threads is usually quicker than switching between processes. If you want to, if you're running a, a process, if you're running a thread on a p- particular CPU core, you deschedule it and launch another thread. That tends to be quicker than descheduling a process. The reason is that all the, the threads share the same um, the same memory, the same virtual memory setup. You don't need to mess around with the memory mappings. So with multiple cores, multiple threads can operate at the same time on the same data. But the important point is you can't scale beyond the number of cores managed by the operating system. So with, if you're going to use threads to do parallelism, you're restricted to what I called in the first week a single node, a single computer. Okay? So you run a program, it launches multiple threads, 
they can't leave this, this computer. So, so threaded programming only scales, allows you to scale up to, to the, the limits of your shared memory machine, which today might be a multi-core laptop. The reason is that it, it only works because a single operating system needs to be in charge of all the CPU cores to share the same memory. So in HPC terms, that means you cannot scale beyond a single node. So if you think about Archer, I said each on Archer consists of 5,000 nodes, each with, 20, each with 24 CPU cores. That means if you're going to do threaded programming on its own, in isolation, you couldn't run on more than 24 CPU cores on Archer, because that's how big each, each node is. Okay. If you want to scale beyond that, you need requires inter-process communication, and that's how we'll do that next. That, that's... that's, that's how we do large-scale parallelism is by having multiple processes talking to each other, where the processes can be on different nodes. So, a classic shared memory concept, if you have an array of size 8 and you want to, 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 to process it using threads, you might say, well, I'm going to um, launch a single program, a single process, but I want, to, uh, I want to run two threads, thread 0 and thread 1, and thread 0 will operate on the first four elements of the array and thread 1 will operate on the second four. And because, um, because they share, you, you, the idea here is the, the whole array of, of size 8 has been declared by the parent process, but because the two threads can seal the memory of the parent process, they can just decide, well, I want to, they can decide arbitrarily which elements they, they operate on because they can seal the, all of the memory of the parent process. So I'll, I'll, I'll use an analogy in the next lecture to, to maybe make this easier to understand. Um, this is why I'm going to, so I'm going to talk about accelerators, GPUs, in the, in the final week, but the, the, way, the way that it, that it works is that accelerators have two, um, have two sort of differences from normal processors. Um, first of all, you have a huge number of threads. You have a large number of hardware threads. So a modern uh, graphics processor, depending on how you count it, will have thousands of, of, of simple um, CPU cores. Okay? So a modern graphics processor gets, gets, gets its power from having lots and lots of, of processors, very simple CPU cores. Secondly, they're also, divide, they're, they're also designed to be able to switch threads in and out very, very quickly. So the way that modern graphics processors work is if you have thousands of physical CPU cores, or little CUDA cores they're called, you might run tens of thousands of threads. Now that isn't something you'd want to do on a CPU because swapping threads in and out, although it's faster than swapping processes, is still quite a heavyweight operation. On a, on, on a graphics processor, they are, they are designed to be able to swap these threads in and out very quickly. So the way you get parallelism in a graphics process, and we'll cover this in more detail in, in week four, is you, you throw thousands and thousands of, pro, of threads at the, at, the, um, at the graphics processor, which itself has hundreds or, or thousands of physical cores, and it will manage all that for you. Um, so... Um, threading is going more and more important on modern HPC machines for two reasons. One is accelerators, one is, is the size of the nodes, and I'll come back to that. But that's just to look ahead to, to the accelerators. OS optimization, um, I said we use Linux um, for HPC uh, systems. How do you get performance? Well, what you do is you really kind of strip it back down. The important point about a, 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 a node, although I said a node of a parallel computer is very much like a laptop, with some network connection coming in. The differences from a laptop are that you, you don't share it with other people at any one time. You're the only person using the node. There's no screen. There's no, don't need to update your Facebook page or check your email. A whole lot of stuff can be stripped down. So a lot of, they're, they're very stripped down. So all the optimizations that vendors do to, to make um, their parallel machines work faster, typically taking out all the features of a fully featured operating system that you don't need. So, your front-end nodes will run a full operating system. Where you log into will be your, 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 what you're used to for doing desktop stuff, editing, compiling, running, and such like. But the back-end nodes, the compute nodes, are very stripped down. So, for example, um, Cray have their own Linux called Compute Node Linux, which is based on, on SUSE, but it's very, very stripped down and, spe and, and, um, and um, you know, tailored to their needs. And one of the most important things that you do is... Um, you remove features that are not needed. You don't need USB support. Um, you don't need to interrupt. I mean, the idea is that, you know, um, the reason that your, your, your typical operating system checks every 10 milliseconds, to, to, what do I need to do? Do I need to move stuff around? Is that it's a multi-purpose general user system. If you've got one person running on a node all the time, 
you can reduce that interrupt period. So you don't need to interrupt people. You can really back off on it. The most important thing that people do is they bind processes and threads to specific cores. So, you know, the, the, the fundamental feature of a multi-core laptop is you just throw lots of processes and threads at it, and the operating system schedules them around, taking them on and off all the cores. Um, that's because your laptop has to cope with hundreds of programs running at the same time when it only has a few physical cores. The way in HPC is we tend to almost universally run, if we have 16 CPU cores, we will run 16 processes or 16 threads, but we'll tailor them. Uh, we won't oversubscribe. And that means that it makes sense to pin, to completely disable all that um, scheduling um, technology and just pin your processes or threads to particular CPU cores and, and not let them move. And that means that that's much more locked down and that makes things much more efficient. You'd never want to do that on a general purpose system. It'd be a crazy thing to do. Um, but that, that's, the, that's probably the main optimization that's in there is that processes and threads are bound to specific CPU cores. We also turn off things like virtual memory and paging and such like. Um, um, you know, if, you, if, if, your, if your laptop starts running out of memory, it will page to disk and swap out stuff it doesn't want. That's very slow. You don't want to do that. Most HPC systems, if, you, if you're if you on an 8-gigabyte node, you act, try and allocate 9 gigabytes, it just crash and say, I don't have it. You probably don't want virtual memory because it will slow you down. So flexibility and ease of use is sacrificed for speed. So summary, I went through that quickly, but as I said, in general, the operating system, as you know, access is there to mediate the access between the user, between software and hardware, the user's interaction. Um, HPC is Linux, and it's very much command line. Um, every application in any operating system is a separate process, but the important part is processes have their own memory spaces. Um, and in HPC, we typically place these on a particular core and don't move them. Um, a single processor can have more than one or more threads. The threads can be scheduled independently, so threads can run in parallel at the same time on different CPU cores, but they share memory with the, they can share memory and switching is faster than for processes. And really, the OS optimizations are there to remove lots of unnecessary features and um, increase, well, here we say user-level control of placement, but basically to, 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 to turn off all this multi-user functionality and basically just pin um, processes and threads to particular CPU cores. So that was a bit of a, um, a run-through, because I think the second talk is more conceptual, um, and so hopefully it will illustrate things. So now I'm going to sort of say... How do we use process and threads in parallel programs? This is the nub of parallel programming. So to what shared variables parallelism, which is based on threads and the shared memory architecture, message passing parallelism, which is based on processes and distributed memory architecture, and a bit about the practicalities. So shared variables is, is, is a programming model which is based on threads, and I'll explain why it's called shared variables. So we've already covered the, the this is a slide from the previous talk. We've covered the basic concept. We have already covered threads can all see the data for a parent process. They can run on different cores, and that's a potential for parallel speed up. So in principle, if you run a process and it allocates an array of size 8, if you have multiple CPU cores, you could, de you could decide to operate that on parallel and hence get parallel speed up by having different threads operating on different subsets of that array. Now, the analogy I like to use is a large whiteboard in a two-person office. So the shared memory is the whiteboard. So you, you, you and your office mate are in the same office. The shared memory is the whiteboard. And the two people on the, working on the same problem are like the threads running on different cores attached to the memory. So you and your, 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 co your, your office mate are like two threads. Why are you like threads? Because you can read and write to the same memory. Okay? So you can both read and write to the same whiteboard. Okay? So the question is, how do you collaborate? How do you work together but not interfere with each other? And immediately you look at this model, you realize that you have... You need, there's a problem. Although you want shared data, you'll want to have some, you'll, you'll have, want to have stuff that only you have control of. You want to have stuff that you can write that your neighbor can't scribble over. And so the fundamental concept in HPC, and this is encapsulated in OpenMP, is that data can be either shared or private. You have this large shared, white, uh, shared memory space, which is like a big whiteboard, and in principle you can share data with each other. But you also need to have your own private memory, and that's called private data. So the way that these threading systems work is whenever you, it's all based on classifying your arrays. Whenever you declare a variable, you have to decide, is this a shared variable which lives in the shared data space, 
or is a private variable which lives in my private data space. And that, that's, um, that's the, the basic thing you have to do. And in practice, the shared data tends to be the big arrays. If you're thinking about a weather forecasting model, the shared data is the big array, your map. All your big arrays and shared data. The private data is there for little bookkeeping things like loop counters and such like. I'll illustrate that in the next, in the next slide. So this is the way that, sorry, that, 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 that it works conceptually. Um, you have a large amount of shared data, many threads with their own private data, but this PC stands for program counter. It's saying that the threads can, are also are running, independent, running programs independently. So these are like little independent mini programs, but, but because, they're, because they're threads and not processes, they can, as well as having their own private data, they can share data with each other. And this shared data is actually the, 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 the data which belongs to the parent process, but that's a bit of a technicality. But I think the analogy of multiple people working in the same office is a really good one. So the way that thread communication works is, um, if, you want, if you have some data you want to communicate to your neighbor, what you do is that you do it by reading and writing to shared data. That's the only communications mechanism you have. The only way you can, this is where the analogy, you're not allowed to talk to your off co-worker. You're not allowed to talk to them. You can only communicate by reading and writing to, uh, data to the shared space. You can reading and writing stuff uh, from and to the shared whiteboard. So if I want thread one and thread two to communicate, thread one might say my a equals 23. Now, immediately I said that um, we had this issue that in, in, in the shared variables model, data can be shared or private. And so whenever you see a variable, you have to say, is that a shared variable or a private variable? Um, I've illustrated by this. By saying my a, I'm, I'm illustrating that's a private variable. So if I say my a equals 23, then that, my, my private copy of my A, 23, is, is set to 23. If I then want to transfer that data to thread 2, I have to write it to somewhere where thread 2 can read it from, so I have to write it to the shared space. And in programmatically, that's just writ, that you can just start saying may, A equals my A. It looks like a fairly innocuous statement, but A is a shared variable and my A is a private variable. So your private copy of my A is copied to the shared copy of A. So A lives in the shared space, and there are ways of, of, of state, I mean, I've just illustrated it through the name here, A and my A, but there are ways in, in, in um, various threaded models of making sure that data is, whether data is shared or private. Then to get that data, thread two can just say, my A equals A plus one. So again, that illustrates two things. First of all, although it's a fairly innocuous statement, my A equals A plus one, it actually transfers the shared data A into the private data thread two, my A, and secondly, because my A is private, A only has one value. A is a shared variable. There is one copy of A. Because my A is a private variable, we all have our own copy of it. So thread 2's my A is different from thread 1's my A because they're, they're private variables. They have the same name, but they're private to each thread, so they can have different values. So that's, that's sort of just illustrating how you would transfer data between two threads. You, you write to and then read from shared data. But there's something here which I've assumed but not made explicit. It's for this to work, the statement my a equals a plus 1 has to happen after the state a, statement a equals my a. This only works if thread 1 writes, a, writes its value of my a to, the, to the, um, the whiteboard before thread 2 reads it. Without that, this isn't going to work. And because these threads are semi-autonomous, being run in independently, there's nothing to guarantee that a priori. So the, so the, the, the trick to getting um, the shared variables model, threaded programming, to, to be correct is you have to put in synchronization. You have to recognize where synchronization is needed, where you need two threads to be ordered, and put the synchronization in. So synchronization is crucial for the shared variables approach. Thread 2's code must execute after thread 1. And there are a lot of ways of doing it, but a simple way is a barrier synchronization. There are other, lots of other me um, mechanisms such as locks and such like, but a barrier is a basically a line in the sand that says nobody proceed past this point until we all get here. Okay? You can do more complicated things, but that's a simple way of doing it. So the, the issue with um, shared variables uh, approach is that writing parallel codes is relatively straightforward. It's relatively easy to have a shared array in this shared whiteboard and have lots of threads updating it, doing lots of stuff, but correctness can be difficult. You can easily write, it's very easy to write programs which, which, are in, which have bugs in them which may not show up all the time, where in this model you, 
you know, 99 times out of 100, thread one executes before thread two, but without guaranteed synchronization in there, sometimes thread two might execute before thread one, and you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay? So that, that's the challenge, that this is a very general model because you have these shared variables. You can just read and write data as you wish. You can share anything you want to with your, uh, your fellow workers, but getting correctness can be, di can be difficult, can be challenging. So writing parallel codes is straightforward because accessing the shared data, you can access the shared data as and when it's needed. So here for a specific example in some kind of pseudocode, if I wanted to add up um, this data, uh, I wanted to compute the sum of the, of, 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 um, of, of the A variable. Well, this is basically doing the calculation I talked about, um, I, I talked about um, last week. Uh, what you would do is you'd write a piece of code where you say, well, each thread is going to execute the same code. This is kind of the model we tend to use in, in, in HPC. Every thread executes the same code. Every th thread executes i equals 1 to i, i equals i start to i stop, my a sum plus equals a i and end the loop. So every code is executing that loop. But what you do is, so we've done two things here. We've, we, we, we've um, exploited the fact that uh, uh, addition is uh, associative so we can add up the first half separately from the second half and add the subsums together. But we've also uh, going, to, uh, going to decide what variables are shared and what variables are private. So typically, we have to, that's, the, that's the challenge in this shared variables approach, is deciding how to classify the variables. Now, clearly, the main array A should be shared. Okay, We want A to be shared. We want to Because the, the, the data is there. We want to just read that data and add it all up. Okay, That's fine. Also, we want one answer. There is only one answer. The sum of the arrays has a single, single value. You want it to be available to everybody. So both the main array and the result are shared. However, to get the correct answer, you need some private data. The loop counter i needs to be private. Okay? Each thread is, by definition, executing different loops. So your, your little bookkeeping i needs to, be, needs to be private. By definition, this calculation only works if i start and i stop are, are, compu are computed so that the two threads operate on different half, halves of the array. Okay, so I want you know thread zero to have i start equals naught and i stop equals three, uh, and thread one to have i start equals uh, four and i stop equals seven. So the loop limits have to be private, and also in the intermediate calculation we're, we're calculating a local, a partial sum which needs to be private. My a sum is private, and so in this it's a fairly classical um, model here. The input and the output are shared, but the temporary variables inside the calculation are private. And so again, I have to compute i start and i stop correctly, but if I do it correctly, then if I compute i start and i stop correctly, and of course they're thread dependent, those values, then at the end, each thread will have its own my a sum, which is its partial sum. We need to add them together. And I have to, if I do a sum plus equals to my a sum to add a, remember a sum is shared, I have to separate these because if I if I have, if I just have every thread adding to, to a sum at the same time, I get a race condition. I don't necessarily get the right answer. I can't have two um, two threads writing to the same data at the same time because there's going to be some kind of conflict there. So I, I, I need to um, uh, I need to separate these. The simplest way here is by a barrier, for example. Have thread do do its summation followed by a uh, thread zero do its addition followed by thread one. I mean, there's more sophisticated ways of doing it, but but that's a simple way. The reason why it may not be immediately obvious why this a sum plus equal to my a sum gives you gives you problems, the reason is that there is, there is no such thing as adding value to a to, to a variable adding a value to a variable. A sum plus equals my a sum is actually implemented by reading a sum, adding to it, and writing it back again. Okay, you read the data from memory onto some register on the processor. You operate on the register and you write it back. If two people do that at the same time, you get the wrong answer. Okay. Two people read the same value of a sum, both add to it and write it back. You don't get the right answer. They need to be ordered. And so, um, and there are more sophisticated ways of doing it than, than this, but this is a simple way of doing it. It turns out um, this is a reduction operation. This is a standard operation. In theory, it would be this. a sum equals 0 if right equals 0, i less than i, double plus a sum plus equals a of i. To parallelize it, I have to replace it by what looks like quite a complicated piece of code. If I was to write this by hand using some library like POSIX threads, it would be a little bit of you know, messing around to get it to work. Um, we'll see that, um, uh, yeah, so that's what we do. Only one thread at a time updates a sum. Um, sorry, 
the reason that you have to chunk this up like this is you, you could parallelize this um, by just saying, well, why doesn't everyone just update the global A sum? Why do I need this temporary variable, my A sum? The problem is if everyone is constantly updating the global variable A sum, it has to be locked or protected. And then there's, there's a lot of clashing between threads. And so this is quite a common pattern. To, to parallelize this loop, we have to do quite a lot of things. We have to split up the loop into separate iterations. We have to spawn the threads. We have to classify our variables, and we have to synchronize them again at the end. And this is quite obviously quite a simple thing to parallelize, and we want to be able to do it automatically, not programmed by hand. And this is where um, OpenMP, this is the way that threaded programming is done in, in um, high-performance computing. OpenMP has directives which can very succinctly say, please compute this sum in parallel. And, and it will all be done, all the variable classification will be largely done for you automatically. So there is some compiler support. So, I mean, I don't have time to go through the syntax of OpenMP, but hopefully I'll give you a working example for the traffic model, which will show you how it works. But the important point is you might ask, you know, why, don't, why do you need some other, given, given that many languages already have support for spawning threads, creating threads, and the operating system can schedule them, why do we need some other technology? Well, parallelizing a simple loop like this by hand requires quite a lot of stuff, but it's fairly automatic, it's fairly mechanical. And so OpenMP is a way of basically um, um, wrapping that up and just allow you to say, you know, parallelize this, this, this reduction loop and it will do it automatically for you. And this, to do this, so, so to have this analogy of lots of um, co-workers in an office reading and writing to the same shared whiteboard, you require hardware support, and you need a shared memory processor. You need a machine where, where physically the processors can read and write to the same memory. And the important point, as I said, about a shared memory processor is not only are all these processors, which will in this model be running different threads, physically connected to the same memory, they're also controlled by the same operating system. So this is the, the reason why threaded programming can't, uh, scale outside of a single node, which you think of as being a single laptop, because it requires all the, the CPU cores which are running the threads to physically be able to read and write to the same whiteboard. It requires all the workers to be in the same office so they can read and write to the same memory. And this is just a little diagram just to show that the operating system moves threads around, but that's not really, that's not particularly important here. So, as I said, threads have existed before parallel computing. They, orig they originally designed for concurrency. They originally allow you to run lots of things on a computer, and they will be run as and when on demand. Okay? So you would not be running. You might have a single CPU core. You spawn lots of threads. You, you know, thinking about being for your, in the game example, for, for moving your ship and moving a bullet and, and, and monitoring the keyboard. And the, C the, the operating system would make sure they were run in turn. They all had the illusion of running at the same time. For parallel computing, uh, we actually typically only run a single thread per core because we want them all to run at the same time. So that might be counterintuitive, but that's typically, you know, in parallel programming, if we have a four-core node or a 24-core node and we were doing threaded programming, we would make sure we only spawn four 24 uh, threads. There's no reason you can't spawn more. It's just probably going to be inefficient. And so because of that, because... You know, the model in, in parallel computing is that you match the number of threads to the number of cores. These are also optimizations come into point, but there's no need to migrate them. If you know that there are the same number of threads as there are cores, just stick the threads on the cores and leave them there. And as I've mentioned this already, threading can be operated up with a single node, which on Arch would be up to 24 cores. It's a simple parallelization. Um, you can speed up a program uh, using multiple threads, but you, you, you can't scale beyond a single node. If you wanted to use multiple nodes, you could either run multiple copies of the program, one on each node, or uh, this next slide, again, slightly out of order. It's a bit, bit too complicated. But the important point is that threaded programming, shared variables model, requires hardware support. It requires a shared memory machine, multiple cores connected to the same piece of physical memory, which means it's limited to a few tens, the few tens of cores you get in a single computer, which in HPC terms is a node. So clearly, Archer has 100,000 cores, 5,000 nodes. People aren't running jobs which only run on a single node. That would be crazy. They must be using multiple nodes. How do they do that? The summary, shared blackboard or shared whiteboard is a good analogy for threads parallelism. It requires hardware support. Synchronization is crucial. It's kind of anarchy, basically. 
you're saying we have this shared space, anyone can read or write to it at the same time, and it's up to you, the programmer, to make sure that's done in a controlled way. But threading in HPC is, is done using something called OpenMP directives, and it, it, it supports the common parallel patterns, reductions, splitting up loops into, 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 into chunks, and so and the, the compiler can do fairly... Um, um, it's not automatic parallelization. It's up to the programmer to identify the parallel loops. But, and so it's fairly explicit, but you, you, you identify them, you say them at quite a high level. Split this loop up across two threads into equal, equal sections, please, and then all the, 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 the mechanics is generated by the compiler. So there is compiler support, but it's not, autom it's not automatic parallelization. It requires um, uh, input from the user. So the way that you scale past a single, um, a single node onto the many thousands of nodes on a modern parallel computer is to use message passing, which is based on processors. So the analogy here is two whiteboards in different single-person offices. This is the analogy because, as I said, processes, a process's data is ring-fenced. You can't read and write directly to another process's memory. That's like you and your co-worker being in different offices, potentially one in Edinburgh and one in Australia, one in, in, um, in Sydney and Australia. And so um, the distributed memory, remember a modern parallel computer is lots and lots of separate nodes, each like a laptop with their own memory. The distributed memory is like these multiple whiteboards, but how do they collaborate on a single problem? Well, there has to be explicit communication. So as I said, a modern supercomputer has a fast network connecting the nodes, the analogy here is you, you have to make a phone call. So in this, in this, um, in the threaded model, shared variables, the communication was kind of implicit. You could, you could communicate with your neighbor, with your, sorry, co-workers, just by reading and writing to the shared variables. Message passing program is much more explicit. Every time you want to communicate with somebody, it's like you have to, picking up the phone and making a phone call. There is no shared data in message passing programming. There is, you cannot share data with somebody. All data is private. If you want to communicate, you have to make an explicit communication, which is analogous to a phone call. And so if we take the same example as before, where we wanted process one and process, sorry, we wanted to have, previously we had two threads, we wanted to take a value of 23 on process thread one and, 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 and send it to, to uh, process two. Um, the, 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 um, the way it was done in, pro uh, sorry, Previously, we communicated a value from thread one to thread two by re writing to and reading from shared, um, shared data, which was like our whiteboard. Here, we can't do that. We have to make explicit communications. And the way it works is, ah, the animation here has got slightly awry. So apologies for that. I don't know what's happened. Um, so process one says A equals 23. Apologies, that, that, that animation is out of order. I don't know what's happened to my, to my slides. So uh, uh, we can just ignore that for the second. For the second. A is set, uh, it's, it's local variable, it's, process one is set A equals 23. So there's no, you don't have to differentiate between shared and private data. I'm not going to worry about A and my A. All data is private, okay? If you have a variable A, you have your own copy of it. You can't share it with anybody, okay? So that's a bit simpler. But the problem here, so that sets my, this is my whiteboard here. That sets the value of A on, on, on my whiteboard in my office to be 23. If I want to communicate it with process two, I have to pick up the phone. And message passing is, 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 is a way of doing that. Message passing is, is based on matching sends and receives. So the sending process actively sends the data, and the receiving process has to actively receive it. So in MPI, the syntax is a bit more complicated, but you, you have a, a function that turns out to be just a library routine, where you say, I want to send my value of A to process two. So you say send A to process two. Um, fortunately, the, the, the animation was slightly out of order. What needs to happen, what that does is it, in some senses, it's like sending an email to somebody. Okay? So what I've drawn here is that the data is sort of appears outside of process two's memory. The reason I've drawn it like that is that process one cannot read and write to process two's memory. You know, this laptop cannot read and write directly to the memory of another laptop. Message passing requires the active cooperation of both sides. So process one sends the data. It's like sending an email. But sending an email to somebody doesn't communicate the data. They have to read the email. So you can think of it, one model is that the data goes into an inbox. That's kind of one model of message passing, mental model. When you send data to somebody, it's like sending them an email. It goes into an inbox. 
For it to actually appear in process 2's memory requires process 2 to actively issue a receive. So process 2 has to say, I want to receive some data from process 1, and I'll decide where I want to put it. I'll put it into my, I'll put it into my variable B. So now B on process 2 is set to 23. So process 1 says I want to send the value A to process 2, so 23 was transferred. Process 2 said I want to receive a value from process 1, which matches that send, and place it in my variable B. And then process 2 can say A equals B plus 1. So although you say, might say there's a variable A, remember in, in, this, in this, um, this distributed memory process model, each process has its own copy of the var variable. So process 1's A is different from process 2's A because they, they can't share, they're, in, they're written on different whiteboards, they're in different memory space. And so the problem there is you might ask, well, wait a second, what happens if process 1 sends a message and process 2 never receives it? Or what happens if process 2 receives, tries to receive a message and process 1 never sends it? So the, the, the issue in threaded shared variables programming is it's very easy to write programs, it's very easy to write incorrect ones. In, in, in distributed memory, um, message passing programming, Typically, if you make a mistake, your program deadlocks. It stops working because you have a process which is waiting for a message and the message never arrives. Or you send a message and in certain situations, if there's no receive, you can, you can stop. And so it's up to the user to match the sends and receives. So it is quite a low-level model, but it's proved to be very, very um, popular and very successful. So... Um, we saw that synchronization was a massive issue in, um, in, in, in shared memory programming. In, in message passing programming, it's not, so, it's not such an issue. If you get it wrong, your program can stop. But it's, it's a bit of a subtlety, but synchronization is what you, you really care in threaded programming. When we had thread 1 and thread 2 running, you really cared if thread 1 was ahead of thread 2 or behind thread 2. Okay? It really mattered that thread 1 wrote to the whiteboard before thread 2 read from it. And so it's important to the programmer to put in synchronization to make sure they're ordered correctly. The questions of who's ahead and who's behind in message passing programming isn't so important because the synchronization is provided automatically by the messages. For example, if I make a phone call, I'm using a phone call analogy here, not an email. If I make a phone call and the other person isn't ready, I just wait for them to pick up. It doesn't matter if I make the phone call early. The phone call still succeeds. So there's a bit of waiting around, but it's not functionally incorrect to phone somebody. You can just wait. Similarly, if I'm waiting for a phone call, I just wait by the phone for it to receive. The fact that it might come a bit late doesn't really matter. And so it, it, it is slightly subtle, but um, it's very rare. It's unusual to get to get um, complicated synchronization issues, race conditions in, in message passing programming. If you make a mistake, your program simply doesn't work. If you get, if you get the communications correctly, because message passing is a two-sided process, you actively send and actively receive, they, they, the synchronization is provided for you by the messages. There is no danger of corrupting someone else's data because I cannot write to somebody else's blackboard or whiteboard. They can, only, they can only receive the data. They only receive the data when they actively issue a receive. That's the problem in threaded variables, threaded programming. I can change a value on the whiteboard without somebody knowing it. Here, I can't change a value without you knowing because you can only re you decide when to pick up the phone. You decide when to, when to read an incoming email. So it's slightly subtle, but... Um, now, I, I've naively talked about um, um, phone calls and emails. Actually, they're, they're, they're fundamentally different in, in message passing, sending a message can be synchronous or asynchronous. And a synchronous, synchronous send is not completed until the message has started to be received. An asynchronous send completes as soon as the message is gone. And so synchronous and asynchronous, which are, 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 are um, um, concepts uh, in, in MPI, they're called communications modes, map directly onto, um, onto making a phone call and sending an email. Okay. So making a phone call is synchronous. If you phone somebody and, and you, you, that phone call is only completed from your side of things when the person picks up the, 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 the receive. So you're, you're hanging on the phone in synchronous message passing. You, 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 you sit in the send until the receive is issued. You, you sit on the phone until the person picks up the receiver. In asynchronous message passing, it's much more like um, posting a letter. 
you stick a letter or you send an email. You send an email, you hit send, off it goes, and then you carry on your work, regardless of whether it's been received or not. So, so, so this becomes an important in um, It's a choice you can make. A modern message passing systems like MPI support both. Um, but but um, it's more of a conceptual idea. If you think about you know, sending, making a phone call and sending an email are fundamentally different methods of communication. One implies synchronization between the two and the other doesn't. In message passing, re receives are usually synchronous. The receiving process waits until the message arrives. So when you issue a receive, you wait until the message comes in. And that's why, if you don't match up your sends and receives, that's why message passing programs deadlock, stop working. You'll have somebody waiting for an incoming message, and no message arrives. And in modern message passing systems, it may surprise you, but there aren't any timeouts, typically. You know, it, the, the, for... for for efficiency reasons, it's assumed you've written the correct program. Okay? So if you issue a receive, you sit there and wait for a message to come in. If your program is incorrect and there is no incoming message, that process will just sit there forever. Okay? There are ways to combat that, but that is the fundamental model. Again, it's, 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 it's sort of linked to the fact that there's no fault tolerance. Okay? If you're writing a fault tolerant system, you would need to have that. You'd say, well, I want, to I want to receive a message from somebody, but to be fault tolerant, I have to take account of the fact that maybe that person's died or had an error. Okay? Message, modern, current way we program HPC machines, parallel computers, assumes everything works all the time. So if you, if you receive, the assumption is you've correctly issued a send, and you will wait forever till it comes in. And so there's a couple of analogies here. Uh, faxing a letter is... is potentially a, an, an analogy for synchronous send, although actually I think making a phone call is probably a better analogy. An asynchronous send, posting a letter is a very good analogy, or sending an email. In an asynchronous send, you only know when the letter has been posted, not when, not when, it's, not when it's been received. So these are conceptually um, two different ways of doing message passing. And the reason I mention them now is that um, if you, when you think about parallelizing the, um, the traffic model using, uh, share, using message passing, it actually matters whether you think about doing it synchronously or asynchronously. You can imagine that doing synchronous send, there's more, there is more, um, and think of the analogy of making a phone call, there's, there's more, it's easier to make, to have a program which doesn't work. Because when you make synchronous send, it requires on there being a receive. When you make an asynchronous send, it doesn't require there to be a receive. Okay? You, pro you will progress whether or not the message has been received. And that actually turns out to be important in the, in the, um, the traffic model. When you think about parallelizing using message passing, it is actually important whether you're thinking about sends being synchronous or asynchronous. It's, it's worth thinking about that. Um, we've already talked about point-to-point -point communications here, which, which is one sender and one receiver. Um, in fact, um, we often want to do different patterns from that. So, for example, at the moment, I'm communicating with you, but I'm not doing it in a point-to-point -point way. I'm we're doing a group communication. And so um, in message passing, that's called the collective operation. It's an operation where all processes are taken together. And I'll go through them quite quickly, but the reason, just to give you the reason why, the reason why there, you might say, well, why do you need to do that? Surely any group operation, which is me sending data to all of you guys, could be done in a point-to-point -point way. Okay? I could send you individual messages. Okay? The reason is that often there are much more efficient algorithms for doing collective communications. There are the naive way of me communicating with, all, with you all would be to send a message to each of you, which takes, if there are 10 people, takes 10 messages, 20 people takes 20 messages. There are much more efficient ways of doing that. So collective operations can often be written more efficiently. And to stop users doing the wrong thing, in message passing systems, they're typically elevated to being single operations. So we have two classes of operation. One is point-to-point -point communication, which is send and receive. The other collective operations where we all take part. And um, they could obviously be implemented through point-to-point -point communication, but they'll typically be implemented in a more efficient way than you could do yourself. So, for example, an obvious collective operation would be to, to compute the average age of everybody in this room. Okay? What I need to know is I need to know everybody's individual age. We add them together, divide by the number of people, and we get the average age. That would be a, a standard collective operation. Everyone gets together to produce a single output. So I'll go through these slides relatively quickly because I'm, I'm running out of time. But uh, collective operations um, um, are, are, are group-wise are group operations, uh, which can be built from simple point-to-point simple -point messages, but they're elevated to a, a separate status for efficiency reasons. I can do a broadcast. I'm doing a broadcast here, talking to you all. 
a broadcaster from one process to all of them. You often do this at the start of a program, and, and this is what the, um, what the sharpen exercise does. One master process reads in the data, and it broadcasts it to everybody so everybody has a copy of it. Scatter is a bit like a broadcast, but the data is split up. And um, so, so basically, th this, is, this is clearly related to this kind of domain decomposition parallelism. You read in some data set on a master process. You don't want to send the whole data set to everybody. You want to send chunks of the data set to everybody. everybody. And a message passing, that's called a scatter. So if I had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it might be split up 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 across the processes. Gather is just the opposite bringing data data together. A reduction operation is what I, so for example, you know, a reduction operation combines data from several processes to form a single result. So everybody has their own input, but there's only one output. So for example, the average age, we all have our own ages, but we agree that there's a single average age. Or at the general election, we all have our own vote, but there's one agreed answer, majority. Um, well, in the UK system, slightly. I'm not a straight majority, but there is a, there is a, there is a process for getting a single answer of who won the election uh, where everybody has their individual input. So a reduction operation, and the most common reduction operation in all message passing programs, in all HPC things, is addition. So for example, imagine that, that example where I was doing the, tr um, the weather forecast. I split the um, uh, Great Britain up into chunks. I went, what's the total rainfall across Great Britain? Well, each process only has a copy of its own data. Each process in the message passing model has a, its own whiteboard with its own chunk of Great Britain on it. It can only compute what the local rainfall is. The local rainfall of a random square of Great Britain is a meaningless figure. The only thing that matters is the total rain, rainfall. So everyone computes their own local rainfall, then we do a global summation, say, well, what's the total rainfall? So global summation is a classic um, thing you do. It's obviously what we wanted to do in the adding up the salaries of, of 7 billion people. Again, we all create our own sub-sum, and then we do a collective operation to add them together. And you can use any um, associative operation, max, min, etc. but addition is the most common one. And so the reason that message passing has been message passing has been the dominant form of parallel programming at the high end for over 20 years, and the reason is the model and the model is separate processes with their own data, reading and uh, communicating by sending explicit messages, sends and receives, maps very nicely onto the real pro hardware where we have separate processors connected by an interconnect. So we run a process on each of these processors. And they communicate with each other via sends and receives. And that can go over some interconnect, some, some, um, some, um, um, some network, which on something like Archer, as I said, is very fast. So that's why it's a natural map to the distributed memory model. The, 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 this conceptual model of message passing maps very naturally onto the hardware model. One process per processor core, messages go over the interconnect between different nodes and operating systems. So as I said, a classical example of a parallel computer would be, um, I only have one laptop here, but two laptops connected by a cable. And in message passing, a process on this laptop could communicate with a process on the other end of this cable by send, sending data which goes down the wire and is received at the other end. You can't read and write data over the interconnect because they're different operating systems, different physical chunks of memory. But we, in message passing, we send data. And it's, they're like, you can think of those like emails or phone calls, different analogies. Uh, apply in different situations. So the summary process cannot share memory the ring fence from each other. My analogy is whiteboards in separate offices. I've been a bit lax here about black and whiteboards. I, I decided on whiteboards. I'll need to make sure I'm more consistent. Communications require explicit messages. It's analogous to making a phone call, sending an email. Um, of making a phone call, I would call synchronous message passing because the two people need to be on the line at the same time. Sending the email is asynchronous. You can send the email, it's fire and forget. You go away and do what you want. And in HPC, message passing is almost exclusively um, done using a library called the message passing interface. So I naively, I just had something called send and receive. But the way it works is your program is compiled with a normal compiler. All the parallel functionality is provided by a library. So the message passing operation sends, receives, collected for all library calls. Uh, so MPI, the message passing interface, is, is the universal way nowadays of implementing message passing programming on large supercomputers. And it's just a, a library of function calls or subroutine calls. That, that's how it's implemented. 
You could invent a new language. People have invented new message passing languages, which where message passing, the parallelism is, is, is intrinsic to the language, but people don't like learning new languages. The only successful approaches have been extensions of existing languages. People still like to write their C, C++, I uh, said last week, Fortran codes, but the, the parallelism implemented through some external library. That, that's, that's, that's not a fundamental requirement, it's just the way that it, 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 it has proved to be most successful. So the only thing I want to say here is, I'm running out of time, but the, the thing which some people surprises, surprises them about message passing is um, in this analogy of, uh, I, I naively had said that there was, um, that there was um, uh, one, I was thinking of a single core machine where I, where, where I had, each person had their own whiteboard and they're communicating with their neighbors. We actually said it's more, more complicated than that. You know, you might have, because of multi-core architectures, you might have four office workers sharing one whiteboard and four office workers in another office. Clearly, to communicate between those offices, we need to use the message passing model. Share, you know, send and receive. We need to phone our neighbors. But within the office, you know, we have this option of, of reading and writing to the same shared, same shared memory. The way, the way that message passing works is that actually people mostly ignore that. So what would they would do on a machine which had two quad-core nodes, two four-core multiprocessor machines connected by an interconnect, is they would just run eight processes there. So clearly for the, for the, for the processes on this node to communicate with the process on this node, they need to go over the interconnect, over the cable. That requires you to send and receive messages. It might seem mad that also these two cores here communicate with each other. The processes running on these two cores here communicate by sending messages to each other. That might seem mad, but that's the way it's typically done. It's like, you know, in the message passing model, you even phone the guy who's in the same office as you. The reason, that might seem a crazy thing to do, but the reason it's not crazy is that the a parallel program is always only limited by its slowest part. And so, in fact, the slowest part is always sending the messages over the interconnect. So the fact that you could do the communication within a, a single shared memory node more efficiently by possibly using threaded techniques is often not an issue. So often when people write message passing programs, they ignore the underlying architecture. They just want to know how many CPU cores do I have. I don't care if it's four nodes with two CPU cores or, 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 or two nodes each with four CPU cores. I'm just going to run eight processes and they're going to communicate by sending and receiving messages. If they're on the same node, that might be quick. If they're on different nodes that go over the interconnect, it might be slow. But that is the way it's done in practically. So as I said, it's like phoning, using the telephone to phone your, your neighbor. It's like saying, look, okay, we've got a shared whiteboard, but we're just going to divide it into this is my half, that's your half, and I'm, I'm going to phone you when I want to speak to you. Um, so a quick summary. Shared variables parallelism uses threads. It requires a shared memory machine. Easy to implement because it's kind of incremental, but it's limited scalability uh, because it only scales up the number of CPU cores in a node, which is, other than GPUs, um, GPUs are a specific class, but modern CPU-based machines, you're talking like a few tens maximum maybe 50 or 100 CPU cores in a single, a single shared memory node. And in HPC, we use some compiler technology called OpenMP. We don't program the threads by hand. We have an interface which allows us to, to mark up lines of code. And, and, it's, and it's explicit. You explicitly tell the compiler to parallelize it, but the compiler does the, 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 me the mechanics for you under your direction. Distributed memory, we, we use processes. Uh, you can run it on any machine because the message can go over the internet. In other words, it can run on a distributed memory machine. You can scale up to hundreds of thousands of cores. It's harder to implement because you have to recognize when you want to communicate with somebody. You have to send the data and explicitly receive it, and that can be quite problematic. You also have to physically distribute the data. You, know, you have to say, if I've split up the map of the, of the UK, I have to place different pieces on different people's whiteboards, which can be onerous. It's harder to implement, but better scalability because it scales up to any distributed memory machine where we, we, we just cable together lots of nodes. And on, in HPC, it's done using the MPI library, the message passing interface. There have been other libraries in the past, but um, for the past 15 years, MPI has been really the only game in town. Everyone uses MPI to do message passing. And nowadays, you can download and run MPI on your laptop if you want. So developing these programs is quite straightforward. So that was, sorry, got slightly over, over, over the piece, but there were 
um, that's the so so the exercise is um, there. There are three exercises which, which you can look at. One is to try and quantify the scaling, the speed up of the Sharpen exercise using the Amdahl's law, August, uh, Amdahl's law, to see how well your prog- whether it fits that reasonably well. Uh, the second one is to do a thought experiment, which is to look at the look at the traffic model, and try and conceptually think how it, how would I parallelize that using the thread model, shared variables, or the process model, dist- uh, distributed memory, message passing, and I will actually give you actual codes which do it using OpenMP and MPI, just so you can see how it's done in practice. And the third exercise you might want to look at is just running, well, just, is running the fractals thing, which illustrates load balancing and, and parallel overheads. That's more fun because you get, you get nice pictures of the, uh, of, the, of the Mandelbrot set or the Julia set if you're more adventurous. The, ex- the instructions tell you how to configure and run the program there. So that's all I had to say. And I said next week we'll take a slight detour and talk more about things which are applicable to scientific, prog- scientific computing as opposed to parallelism things like uh, random numbers and, um, and, and floating point operations, floating point, and floating point numbers, and then we'll come back on the final week to, to concentrate more explicitly on GPU programming, which I think is quite a hot topic at the moment. So hopefully the concepts we've covered in the first two weeks will, will allow you to understand GPUs at sort of more conceptual level. Okay, thanks. <laughs>